Okay, now from uh, some startling developments in the Supreme Court case, the startling developments in the Trayvon Martin case. It turns out, this is really important, we have the surveillance video. There's George Zimmerman after they brought him in. There doesn't appear to be any bruises on him. Where's the bloody nose? There's the back of the head. Where's the blood there? That is devastating. We're going to talk about that when we come back. And also, Bobby Rush, a congressman, well, he gets booted out of uh, the House for trying to show sympathy to Trayvon Martin. All that when we return. Just because someone wears a hoodie does not make them a hula. Denver is no longer recognized. All right, we have huge, huge developments in the Trayvon Martin case. First of all, we have the surveillance tape of George Zimmerman being brought in to the police headquarters on that night. Let's watch that tape together and let's look at it. Now there he is, he comes out of the cop car. Remember, he's supposed to have a broken nose according to his defenders and his account, and he's supposed to have blood on the back of his head. I, I can't see the blood, I can't see any bruises. I don't see a broken nose. Now it's possible that the paramedics fix them up a little bit, but he, this man does not look like he was assaulted within an inch of his life, does he? That's him on that night. Where's the huge gash on the back of his head? We're seeing the back of his head. I don't see anything on the back of his head. Where's the, the big bloody nose? That, remember, this guy shot a guy in the chest because he was so, he has to be afraid for his life in order to do that. Where are all these theoretical injuries that we've been hearing about for weeks now? This is devastating. ABC News has uh, gotten the surveillance tape uh, from Sanford Police Department on the night of the shooting, and there's the back of his head again. I don't know, can you tell that there's anything there at all? If it is, it certainly doesn't look very large or very problematic. In fact, remember, uh, the paramedics uh, s didn't bring him to a hospital because they didn't think that there was anything. Well, and there's his face, there's the nose, Ah, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. That tape just came in. So does that guy look like a guy who was devastated within an inch of his life and had to shoot somebody in the chest? All right, it gets worse for George Zimmerman. Now we hear about a 13-year-old witness who actually saw the scuffle. His mom went on, went on Al Sharpton's show just now, and uh, her name is Cheryl Brown. She's there with her lawyer and describes what happened when the lead investigator on the case came and spoke to them, finally, five days after they'd been calling, saying, come speak to us, we our son witnessed it. Listen to what she says. Now, as the investigators communicated with you and arranging and talking to you around the interview of your son, did they tell you whether they felt this was self-defense or not? The lead investigator from the Sanford Police Department stood in my family room and told me this was absolutely not self-defense and they needed to prove it. Um, he told me, and I'm paraphrasing this quote, but read between the lines, this, uh, there's some stereotyping going on here. Wait a minute. Uh, that's another two enormous points there. Number one, there's some stereotyping here and it was not self-defense. Remember we told you last night, the lead investigator thought Zimmerman was lying and that he should be arrested and then people above him made a decision not to arrest him anyway. Oh, those are really damaging details. Now, we go to Joe Oliver, who's been the main character witness for George Zimmerman on television, all over television. And we were told that he, oh, and he is a friend of Zimmerman and he's been talking to him. And now we find out when he went on Lawrence O'Donnell's show, not exactly. First, let's find out how close they were. I've known George about six years. I've known him ever since he started dating his wife. Uh, his mother-in-law is a close friend of the family. So, you haven't known him that long. Your mother-in-law is a close friend of your wife or something along those lines. Well, he's going to admit later how close or unclose they are. Charles Blow of the New York Times was also uh, interviewing here. Let's watch. Hey, how can you claim that you are a close friend of George Zimmerman when none of that is true of you. You don't really know George Zimmerman if you don't know those things about George Zimmerman. And if you don't know where George Zimmerman is, 
And if you have not seen him in over a month and you have been going out saying that George cannot stop crying, which you cannot verify because you were not there, you have been saying, nope, you have been saying that there are lacerations and his nose is broken. And the only, way you, only thing you know is what George may have told you because you were not there and you have not seen him for over a month. None of this rings true. You're playing people like they're stupid and we're not. So he hasn't even seen Zimmerman? Well, we just saw Zimmerman. Did you see lacerations and all the things that this uh, Oliver guy's been describing? And now we find out he hasn't even seen him. It's absurd. Then Jonathan Capehart comes in for finally to try to figure out, you know, how well do you know this guy at all? I'm being described as a close friend because I'm the only right. one who's speaking out for him. But my relationship with George is more of uh, an older uncle. I've, I'm old enough to be his father. Well, right. I mean, well, the I'm discussions that I've had with George have been, in general, have been about our, our, you know, our mutual acquaintances, about what's going on with each other. So uh, you're not, and, and it's not yeah. something that you're going to take notes about. And and, and you so know, just to be, so Mr. Oliver, just to be clear, so you're not a close friend of George Zimmerman's. At at best, judging by your last answer, you're really just an acquaintance. Well. You don't even know the guy that well. It's unbelievable. All right, so as you can see, this so-called Zimmerman defense is in a world of trouble here. All right, now, uh, I want to bring in my guest here. I've got a professor from USC. Uh, Jody David Armour is a professor uh, from uh, USC Law School. And I want to talk to him about this. As uh, you know, before I go to him, let me show you one. Okay, well, there he is, actually. So let's go to him right now. Professor Armour, great to uh, see you here. Thank you. So, um, First of all, you're a law professor. Is stand your ground even applicable here? It may not even be applicable since he pursued him and may have been the initiator and provoked the encounter. And even if it isn't applicable, though, he may still have a defense. And what's that defense? The defense may be that a reasonable person in my situation would have feared for his life or would have thought that this young man was about to attack him. That's all that self-defense law really boils down to. Would a reasonable person in the situation of the defender think that he was about to be attacked? Now, is it about to be attacked or is it about to lose his life? Because in order to use lethal force, don't you have to be worried that you're going to you know, be met with lethal force. You would think typically that you can only use lethal force to avert a lethal attack, but there are justificatory principles built into the self-defense law in different states. Florida is one of them that allows you to use self-defense even when your life isn't in danger, just to stand your ground, i.e., you could retreat without taking his life. Your life isn't in danger. You can actually save your life by retreating, but the law allows you to take his life just to keep from retreating. So it's not only when your life is in danger, but also when you think that you're threatened in some way and may have to leave. That's what I worry most about in this kind of case. I hear you, but under that absurd hypothetical, okay, which yeah. unfortunately is the hypothetical, might be the hypothetical here, if Trayvon had a gun, then he also didn't have to retreat. So we're at the OK Corral, aren't we? I mean, is the minute they both have a gun, they have the right that if one of them approaches the other, that they can shoot each other dead. The worry is that that may be the case. But if you remember back, some viewers may not remember this, 1986, Bernard Getz, celebrated subway vigilante in New York, actually unloaded on four black youth. And a jury acquitted him, even though four of the youth were running away from him at the time he was shooting them, because they concluded that a reasonable person in this situation would have been fearful of those black youth. So the only question is, does the jury sympathize with the defendant? If they feel sympathy and empathy for him, they'll acquit. So are you saying that race could be part of the defense? No question. So there, so he says, oh, this is beautiful. So Zimmerman can say, well, since he was black, I had a reasonable expectation that he might do me harm. He wouldn't have to say it explicitly, but he will subtly get that in. He, will ha he, he can just point out to the jury, look at the person who was approaching me. Look at the hood over his head. Where have you seen hoods like that before? In, in grainy film where people are holding up stores and the like. So an ordinary person, that's the reasonable person test, just an ordinary person in my situation would have feared for his life when he looked at this black young person, you consider gender, you consider age, you consider race. If somebody dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit, you're going to treat differently than somebody in a hoodie is what he's going to say. So if I can consider so gender. So it's kind of like the Geraldo Rivera defense. Well, he had a hoodie and look at how he looks and especially, and Geraldo mentioned my kid has darker skin. If you have darker skin and you wear a hoodie, well, so then if you're white then and I shoot you, you have 
I have less of a defense. Oh, no doubt. No uh, doubt. That's absurd. No doubt. And then there's a second absurdity here, which is that since Trayvon does not have a gun, well, he can't stand his ground. No, he can't. <laughs> he has to run. He has to hot foot it. And this sends a signal out to black youth all over America that you should conduct yourself in a timorous and withdrawn fashion whenever you're around anyone who might have a gun who might mistake you for a threat. Now, all this being said, okay, when you see the surveillance video that we just saw, that's got to hurt Zimmerman's defense that he felt that he was in mortal danger no matter what the race of the kid or what he was wearing. Bernard Getz in 1986 shot four black youth while they were running away and the jury sympathized with him enough to acquit him. Rodney King, when he was getting beaten by the police officers, the jury in Simi Valley uh, uh, sympathized enough with the police officers to acquit them. If the jury sympathizes enough with Zimmerman, even with those facts, they might find a way to acquit him. Wow. All right, Professor Armour, thank you so much for joining us. Really sure. appreciate it.